This is the video podcast for Chapter 19 of Field Methods in Hydrology, dealing with Vedos Zone Hydrology, which also relates to soil physics. And the fundamental question we want to address here is, how do you measure how much water is being held in the soil? And there's going to be two primary technologies and variables that we're going to measure to get at that. So just to remind you again, here's a little cross-section through the, the landscape, we have the soil surface, this topographic line, maybe even connecting with a stream in the groundwater table. <clears throat> and we define the Vado zone as the area from the soil surface down to the groundwater table. <clears throat> Within that zone, we can pick any cube of soil and we could do a water balance on that. Um, because we're not at the surface, we wouldn't have direct precipitation. Instead, we would have water infiltrating down to our box. And then you can have evapotranspiration straight out of there. <coughs> there also might be a lateral flux of water moving through as unsaturated or saturated um, soil water. So we have those lateral in and out fluxes. And then you could have a deeper drainage, which could be still just infiltration or groundwater recharge, depending on how you define your soil zone. Okay, well, let's just look at some basic relationships. Um, this looks like a whole lot of stuff, but it's really very straightforward. It's just considering V for volume and M for mass and different variables that we can define with that. So if you think about the volume of a, of a cube of soil, it's going to attain the volume of solids, the volume of liquids, and the volume of air. We could also divide that in terms of mass. So the total mass is the mass of solids, the mass of liquids, and the mass of air. So that allows us to then think about the concept of a porosity, where we can divide the volume of pores as equaling the volume of liquid and volume of air. So it's essentially um, the non-solid phase of what's in soils. And the porosity has the definition of the volume of pores relative to the total volume of the soil. Dry bulk density, we've already been playing with quite a bit, both dry and wet. Um, we use the symbol rho for that. And so it's the mass of dry soil versus the total volume of the soil. And then the wet bulk density is the mass of solids and liquids divided by um, the total volume. And, and note here that uh, the order of operations is a little bit uh, mistaken here. I should probably have a parenthesis in here, but it's, it's the, the total mass of solids plus liquids divided by the total volume. Uh, then, then we can define the water content, which is really the main variable that we're interested in, as uh, either by, by mass or by weight, uh, I'm sorry, by mass or by volume, and that's going to equal the Basically, you're trying to get the, the mass of water divided by the total dry mass. To get at the, the mass of water, we take the wet soil, weigh it, we dry it in an oven, weigh it again, and the difference between those two weights is the weight of the liquid or the water. And so we divide that by the, the, the dry weight, and that gives us the, the fraction um, by, of, of water by mass. For by volume, we just take the total liquid divided by, I'm um, sorry, yeah, the, the liquid volume divided by the total volume, and then that would be that uh, volumetric water content. Another thing you can do, because a lot of times we report numbers in hydrology in depths, like you know runoffs in millimeters per day or precipitation in millimeters per day. So to have the same thing, we could define the equivalent water depth as the volume of liquids divided by the surface area of the soils, and that would be a depth equivalent DC. Okay, so now we have to get into a few basic concepts because just like how in groundwater, we had to consider the hydraulic head in order to understand how water moves through the ground, um, so too do we have to be mindful of hydraulic head to understand the relationships between the amount of water in soils um, pressure, gradients, and uh, the texture of the soil. Okay, so to set this up, I first want you to consider a very simple experiment. 
Imagine a glass beaker, which is shown by this outer solid line, and we'll, we'll fill it with water up to this level. So what's that, like a quarter full with water, something like that? Now, because the water is in uh, a beaker, it's not flowing, right? It just it, it's, uh, has a flat water surface, maybe a little meniscus around the side. Now, let's take a thin tube and stick it into the middle of this, uh, of this beaker and just let it sit there. What will happen is that water will rise into the tube up to some height, HC, and it might even also have a little meniscus around that. So the question we need to understand is why is the water rising and um, what does that mean in terms of something like a hydraulic head? If you consider the point C that's in the air and you consider the point A that's in the air, they're both at atmospheric pressure. Now, technically speaking, C is a little higher than A, so for some minuscule amount of difference in, in the, you know, with, with the weight of air, there would be a difference between A and C. But for all intensive purposes, A and C are, are at atmospheric pressure. So what does that mean about the pressure at points of B and D? So this would be a good time for you to pause and think about it uh, what you think, knowing that A in particular is at atmospheric pressure, what does that tell you about the point B? So just pause for a second. Okay, by now you figured it out or you're stymied, and I would be stymied, uh, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, the first piece of logic that will help you think about it is that the water isn't moving. And remember that one of our axioms for water flow on the Earth's surface unless you're talking about massive continental scale oceanic flows or something, or atmospheric flows, but, but for most purposes, flows on the ground and in, in the terrestrial terrain, uh, go from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So for that reason, since the water is not flowing, Okay, like we've, we've let this thing adjust, the water has risen up in the tube, now it's, it's stopped. So everything is static. So since it's static, that means that um, you cannot have a pressure gradient for any given horizontal line. So for the surface across A at, the, at this water surface or what's called the water table here, there's no gradient or else water would be flowing either from A to B or B to A. And since the water isn't flowing, it means that the pressure at B must be equal to the pressure at A. If the pressure at B was higher because it's under the weight of this water, then it would be flowing. On the other hand, if, if the pressure of B was lower than A, then the water would be flowing to B and it would equilibrate. So A and B must have the same pressure, which is atmospheric pressure. Now how can this be? I mean, why isn't the water, why does the point B not feel the weight. Well remember in the instance where we first put the the dry tube into the water there was no water at point D at all. The water rose up the tube and if water is going up it means that its weight is not being felt on what's beneath it. In fact there's something that we might call a suction almost like a syringe sucking the water up except in this case there's no piston or you know thing to to pull and, and literally draw it up. So what's drawing it up in this case is just the idea of capillary forces. That is the action of the glass of this tube, um, its affinity to hold onto the water, and with that affinity, it's pulling it up in the tube. So if B is at atmospheric pressure, then what's D? Well, D, since it's above B, it has to be at a lower pressure than B because it's still in the water, but it's higher up. So it has to have a lower pressure. And that's the key to understanding what we're going to learn about soils. So first I'm going to show you two definitions in words, and then I'm going to show it to you in a drawing. And then we're going to get into the field methods for measuring these different things. So the first hydrological term I'd like to introduce you to, if you haven't already taken the soil physics class, is field capacity. The idea of field capacity is if I had a, if I had a, imagine a, a, a pipe full of soil that was open on the bottom and the top, and I ran water on the top of it, and I let it drain, you know, I let it fill up, basically, let the soil fill up. 
Then I turn it off, okay? Then I turn off the water and I let it keep draining out of the bottom. Eventually, you'll reach a point where water will stop dripping out of the bottom of the tube and we'll have the water that's being held by the soil and nothing more, nothing less. That's called field capacity, the maximum water that soil can hold against gravity. So again, this is an idea of a suction, the idea that the soil, just like the glass in the tube that I showed for the capillary experiment in the previous slide, that the soil can hold onto the water through a capillary force. When it's doing that, it's, it's creating a pressure, it's, it's actually creating a suction, and when it does that, there, that pressure can be measured. We'll talk about how, how you measure that in, in a few minutes. But basically, that's being, that's being held with a pressure of 0 0.33 bars. And here we add the negative sign to indicate that it's a pressure, I mean, sorry, that's a suction and not a, a pushing weight, but it's the suction of the soil on the water holding it there. Uh, there was a work done by Frank Viemeyer, who is the, uh, you know, who we honor with Viemeyer Hall being named after him. And this was, study was done in 1931. It says the moisture equivalent as a measure of the field capacity of soils. It's a classic article that explains a lot of this. And one of the challenges is that the water content that's associated with this pressure or this suction is not the same for all types of soils. You can imagine that a sandy soil would give up a lot of it and hold very little water at field capacity Whereas a clay, you know, because it has very, very fine particles and a lot of capillary um, capability, then it's going to hold more. So that's something we have to think about. So in terms of a field methods course, the measurement method is pretty similar to what I've already described. You just need to take a wet soil profile, cover the top so there's no evaporation, and then let it drain and measure the water content as it's draining. Once the draining stops, then the water content that it has, you know, it's, the water content is going down, it's going to sort of asymptote down, and when it gets to that nearly constant level or, or very, very small change over a long time, then that would be your field capacity. And I, I'm giving you here, if, if you want to see a very detailed methodology, then I've given you a citation for that. Okay, the next uh, drier condition, so now, you know, you let the soil dry out, it, and you keep going, right, because the, the, uh, the water in the soil could be evaporating directly because there is air in the soil. It could also be undergoing, um, being taken up into plants and transpiring away. So eventually you reach a point where plants can no longer draw water out of the soil, which is almost sort of hard to believe, you know, but again it comes back and I can't help myself, but it's almost like thinking of, 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 of soil particles like some child, like a little straw, like, me, 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 I want water too. And then the plants like this other child, me, 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 give me the water. And so the soil and the water are battling it out. Uh, with this, I'm sorry, the soil and the plants are battling it out for the water like, like two little kids. Uh, so the permanent wilting point is the water content and associated head at which the plant can no longer take water out. It's gotten so dry, the soil's suction is so strong that it, the plants can no longer compete. And um, that is defined here as occurring at negative 15 bars, uh, and that's going to occur um, for different soil textures, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, for different water contents. Okay, so about half of the water in the soil at field capacity is held too tightly to be accessible to plants. Um, and now, unfortunately, of course, the permanent wilting point is not something that you can easily measure. So how, you know, because obviously you'd have to have something that would function like a plant to be competing against the soil. As a result of that, the, the permanent wilting point is often estimated based on texture. And the field capacity can too. But as a volume percent, here are some, uh, here is the capacities for different kind of textures that are there. <coughs> so you can see, uh, you could just pull that as, as a, you know, a first cut if you're making some sort of equation or something. 
So let me just show this again in terms of a graphic. So I've explained it by words, but begin with a soil that's very wet. You know, you, you're running a hose or a faucet over it. Water is, is, has fully saturated the soil and it's dra draining by gravity. As it's draining, eventually it reaches a point when, if you turn off the, the water supply, of course, when um, gravity can no longer drain water against the suction imposed by the soil. And that occurs at field capacity, which is at negative 0.33 bars. Now you're in the realm of field capacity, and at this point we have what we call capillary water, where water is being held in the pores, but plants can start sucking it out, and evaporation can be taking place because it's unsaturated, meaning that there are air pores here that can be receiving um, water molecules and then exchanging that to the surface and getting rid of it. However, if it continues to get dry, eventually it'll reach such a level of suction, which is at negative 15 bar, that uh, plants will not be able to draw water out of the soil anymore, and that's the wilting point. Below that, we had just have this hygroscopic water, just it's adhering to the soil particle and it's unavailable to the plants. Okay, so those are the three different uh, domains, and they're delimited by these heads. So how do we find out for any particular soil what the water content is associated with these pressure values? Well, the answer is you need to be able to measure pressure and you need to be able to measure water content. So those are the two things that we're going to focus on um, in terms of field methods. Just to recap also, when you think about the forces that are holding on to the water particles, First, there's a balance where, where just gravity, the weight of the water, is going to allow the water to infiltrate or flow down. But eventually, uh, the soil is going to be holding on to the water as, as the situation gets drier and drier. And if you think of an individual soil particle, there is the adsorptive force, which is the attraction between water and that one particle. But when you look at a whole bunch of particles in aggregate, we call that the capillary force. And that leads us to the concept of matrix potential. I've been using this term suction or hydraulic head. However, usually when we think of hydraulic head, we're thinking of a positive pressure weighing down on something. Whereas in this case, we're looking at a negative pressure in that a particle is drawing, drawing that water towards it. Uh, and so that common vernacular of suction is defined as jargon using matrix potential. Um, and there's an inverse relationship between matrix potential and soil moisture. So if you look at this graph on the x-axis is the volumetric water content in the soil. Zero would be dry and you know you're, you're not going to get uh, a regular you know landscape soil with more than 50 percent water content. If you do, you're probably in some kind of you know wetland or swamp or something like that and then you can see that at that point there's so much water in there it, it isn't uh, it's then it starts to turn into a positive hydraulic head. So when we look at this you can see the matrix potential is on a log scale Zero, uh, well, this must be 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and so on. So when you have a very high water content, the matrix potential is very small. Now notice here that the numbers are not negative. Um, it is a suction, so it is negative relative to atmospheric pressure, but you know, of course, if you're a soil scientist, you don't want to have to use negative values all the time. So you just think of it as like the positive suction or the positive matrix potential. So we only report the positive values. So as the volumetric water content goes down, the soil is going to be holding on to that water with greater and greater force. And so then that goes up. Okay. And this, the shape, this shape here is what we call a characteristic curve, and it will vary as a function of texture of the soil, as illustrated in this slide here. So we have the same thing, the x-axis is water content by volume percent, and the y-axis is the force in different kinds of units. Um, and what you can see is for any given water content, a sandy soil has very little ability to hold on to it, has very little uh, capillary forces that would apply. Silt would have a higher 
matrix potential, and then clay would have the highest for any given water content. You could also see that the shapes of the curve change too, so that um, you know, like you can give up a lot of water in sand before the pressure starts to go up. On the other hand, for clay, the the uh, even a small decrease in water content causes a large change in in uh, matrix potential. So how do you measure matrix potential? Well, if you remember the technology that was called an atmometer that was used for evapotranspiration, it's the same technology except we just turn it around. Instead of having a reservoir of water that we allow to wick away through the top in a ceramic cup, now we have a ceramic cup that's oriented downward into the soil and we have a reservoir of water but now that reservoir is held under a sealed condition and as the soil like sucks on that like a, again I say you know a baby sucking on on a on a uh, on something a popsicle or whatever a piece of plastic or a toy or a tube um, that soil is trying to suck on that it's trying to suck the water out of the tube but um, eventually the pressure is going to be increasing and increasing in the tube. So let me explain this now in a more direct way rather than by relation to the atmometer. If you start with a ceramic cup, and if you look at this photo, the white area here is a ceramic cup. Um, it's porous all the way wherever it's white. And porous means that water that's held inside that cup can drain out of it. Then there's a plastic tube, which doesn't have to be clear, but in this case it is clear, just makes it easier to see. And then you fill that up with water, uh, not completely, but you fill, you put water in there. Then you put a seal over the top using a rubber material that's called a septum. When you do that, whatever pressure there is in the air is set, you know, like for example, at atmospheric pressure. Now, if you want to, you could apply a, a, a suction to that and get rid of it, but that's not a good idea. We just want to start at atmospheric pressure, and we're going to start with this, uh, whatever level of moisture is in the soil. And what happens is that the water is going to start gravitationally draining out of the ceramic cup, also being pulled by the suction of the soil. Well, very quickly, the pressure inside the air in the tube is going to go negative. Uh, it's basically going to create a vacuum because just like if you're using a hand pump sucking the water, sucking the air out, well now um, as the water is draining down, you get that suction uh, and that, that matrix potential in the air. So what happens is that eventually um, the vacuum in the tube has such a strong pressure that it's like, no, I'm not going to give give that up. And the soil's trying to pull, and now this vacuum is exactly balancing it. So you'll eventually reach a steady state where water, it literally can't drip out by gravity, and it can't be sucked out by, gra by the soil because the vacuum in the air is so strong that it balances it off. And once that equilibrium has been achieved, then all you have to do is poke into the septum with a pressure gauge and read what that vacuum is, what the matrix potential is. And here's another way of looking at it that just shows this um, a, a more traditional sensor. You can see the ceramic cup at the bottom. Um, then there's water in this tube. Uh, there's a cap that's locked in here. And then you have a gauge. And so as uh, you, you know, you, you put it in, it does take a, a minute or two to equilibrate, just depending on, you know, what the suction or matrix potential is of the soil. And the dial on the, the needle on this, you know, uh, analog gauge will just go around until it reaches the equilibrium pressure such that the, uh, the you know, the, again, the negative pressure reading, or we could call that the positive matrix potential inside that air tube is exactly the same as what's in the soil and that will lead to the characteristic curve. Here are some different brands of tensiometers. This is um, by one company, this T1 tensiometer. So you have to dig a little bit of a hole in the ground like with a, with a, 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 a solid screw auger. So you just screw that down. You would make sure the auger has the diameter of this tube and you may remember uh, if you you know it, 
I've showed an auger that just just looks like a screw, and you have that T, and you you turn it around and and make that hole, and then you push this ceramic cup in there. You just have to be careful not to push so hard that it's going to break the cup, uh, especially if the soil is quite dry and rigid, like if it was it was a dry clay, it could be quite hard to deal with. Anyway, you put that into the to the um, the the core tube that you've cored out of the ground. Um, then you put water inside here, you put the septum on, and then when you want to, you can poke the needle, and you can see there's a needle in here. Um, you could leave it in permanently or just come when you need to take a reading. Of course, every time you poke through the septum, you are releasing a small amount of air, so you have to let it equilibrate, so that's just a, a little bit thing to be careful of. Um, but anyway, this is a nice sensor. Note that it's not for horizontal installation. It's only for vertical installation. It's not for use in frozen conditions or for totally dry soils. Um, okay, well, again, you know, recognizing that, that ceramic cup, it's very fragile, and you need to have a very good connection between the soil and the ceramic cup in order to get a good reading. If, if you put it in a hole and the hole is free draining, then you're not going to be feeling that soil suction, that those capillary forces. Um, so another sensor is by a company called Decagon, and this sensor does have ceramic on it as well. Except instead of uh, applying the same kind of suction, uh, what this is doing um, is it's, it's, a, it's a different technology for being able to measure the matrix potential right through the, through the dielectric circuitry. So it's another one of the sensors, and we'll see other examples of it, where it's focusing on the dielectric constant of the medium around it rather than having to draw suction and hold that the way that a, a classic uh, a tensiometer needs to. Okay, so those are examples for measuring the matrix potential. Now, another thing you need to do in order to get your soil characteristic curve is to directly measure the um, amount of water in there. And to do that, you, there are different technologies. Of course, the classic, most simple method is the gravimetric method, which we've already seen with the brass ring, where you take a sample out of the ground uh, of a known volume, you weigh it wet, you weigh it dry, and the difference is that water content. So you can get that by mass or by volume, really. Um, so that's, of course, very straightforward. But the big problem is it's destructive. You know, if you have to go back time and time again, or let's say you want to know through depth, you'd probably have to make a trench and protect the trench and then and see that. It, it, we'd like to have some ways that don't destroy the soil but can measure the, the water content independently. The first one is called the neutron probe. And I'm going to show this in words, and then I'm going to show you the drawing, and we'll go back and forth. The idea of a neutron probe is you first dig a hole in the ground that has like a two-inch diameter, um, and then you put a plastic tube in there, basically like you're making a well, um, but it doesn't go down, you know, you're not going down 30 or 40 feet usually. You, you might only be going six or seven feet just to see the moisture in the surface soil region. So you've got that tube in there, and of course you want that tube to be as snug against the soil as possible because uh, we're trying to have good contact with the soil so that we're directly measuring soil conditions, not air or ponded water that's due to a poor fit. Now what happens is you lower a neutron source into the tube, and maybe you lower it down to 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters, 15 centimeters. <clears throat> At each position, you pause, and you allow that neutron source to release what are called fast neutrons. So this is a radioactive device, but it is taking place under the ground, and you do wear a radioactive badge while you're using this technology. Because the hydrogen atoms in water, because we write H2O, um, the hydrogen atoms have about the same weight, same mass as the neutron, then when these fast neutrons collide into the water, it's almost like, like two pool balls hitting each other. They're going to um, share the momentum and slow down. And when it slows down, then some number of those slower neutrons are going to 
reflect back towards the neutron source, at which point there's a detector. And that detector counts the number of slow neutrons and reports that. So given that the source is producing fast neutrons at a pretty typical rate, then the count of slow neutrons tells you the count of hydrogen ions it's, it's, or hydrogen atoms it's encountering. And the, obviously, since the primary source of hydrogen in the soil is water, then it's going to be reflecting the water content. So we're creating a calibration, essentially. We're not measuring the water content directly, because only the gravimetric method is going to do that. But you could use the gravimetric method and use the neutron probe to figure this out, make a relationship, a calibration curve, and then thereafter, for that soil type, you could just use a neutron probe. And what, let, let me show this now in, a, in another way. So here's the access tube into the soil, and then sitting on top of that is the device. The device has within it a spool of cable with the, um, the neutron probe. There is a, a, a heavily shielded part of the, the sensor to protect, protect you from um, the neutrons when you're carrying it around. <clears throat> and then there's the counter at the top. So you, you lower this down. And what's nice about this is you're getting a profile of soil moisture, not just an individual value like with the gravimetric method. So you stop it at different positions along the way, you get your count over that interval, and you have the relationship between the gravimetric method and that neutron probe reading. One of the complications with this method is that organic matter also has hydrogen. So think about it, like a mineral soil is generally an aluminosilicate. So it has aluminum, silica, oxygen, and then a whole variety of lesser minerals like magnesium, potassium, iron, things like that. Organic matter is made up of carbon and hydrogen, maybe oxygen, but a lot of carbons and hydrogens. Uh, and then water is made up of you know, two hydrogens for every oxygen. <clears throat> so if you have a high organic content, and especially if that's variable, then you would have to you know, consider using a different technology or just making a unique calibration curve for that soil. Also, um, the area over which the neutron probe is going to be sensing is not just a spec. You know, it's not just a small area like the brass ring from a gravimetric sample. It's going to be over a larger area the distance over which that these fast neutrons hit, uh, you know, spread out, hit things, and return back. Here's an example of a neutron uh, probe calibration from an area on the UC Davis campus called the Campbell Tract. Uh, on the x-axis is the count, and on the y-axis is the volumetric water content. In general, you can see that as water content goes up, <coughs> I'm sorry, yeah, then the count goes up. Um, these are measurements at three different depths. The 15 and 30 centimeter depths are the solid circles, and then deeper depths from 45 to 105 centimeters are the open squares. There's no obvious trend between the two, but it does look like there's bigger scatter in, um, uh, in the, the surface layer. And in fact, if you look at the R squared, considering just the surface layers, the R squared is a lot lower than it is for deeper. So that's probably because you have higher porosity, more organic content, perhaps different textures. Um, <clears throat> so that all makes a big difference. But you can see overall that there is a relationship here. There is quite a bit of scatter as well. So for a water content of you know 0 0.25 cubic meters per cubic meter, um, it looks like you could have you know a count of 0.75 all the way up to 1.05. So there, there can be quite a lot of variability there, um, which just represents the uncertainty that's mes uh, evident in trying to get soil moisture. Here's an example of neutron probe data where the x-axis is time and the y-axis is depth. <clears throat> so, uh, no, sorry, the y-axis is moisture content and there's three different depths. So a very high moisture content over this period and then um, decreasing through time with spikes 
<clears throat> you can see that each spike at the top is labeled minor or major rainfall events. And so the rainfall event is wetting up the surface quite a bit, but then as you go deeper and deeper, you see the effect to a smaller degree. So two of the main benefits of the neutron probe are one, the ability to record soil moisture at a variety of depths, as we saw in the previous one, you know, 15, 30, 45, 60, 75, 90, 105. So that's a lot of measurements to make. Imagine if you had to do that with the gravimetric method, like you'd have to take a soil core down for a meter and then, um, you know, process that material, which would create a hole in the soil that, you know, you'd basically, if you have to poke holes all the time, eventually you're going to run out of spots at each sampling site. Whereas if you have a neutron probe, you install that tube once, you don't leave the neutron probe there, you just cover the access tube, and you could have 100 access tubes around your watershed or something like that, um, carry the neutron probe to each one, one at a time, and take the readings. And that brings up the other point is you can go back to the exact same spot time and time again over many years and see what these readings are like. So that's uh, a really good benefit of the neutron probe. Although the main problem is just simply that with any of these technologies, there's some noise in the data. Okay, the next technology is time domain reflectometry, TDR. It's another method for getting at soil moisture, but instead of using neutrons, it uses a far safer technology, which is one we've already seen two or three times before, including earlier in this presentation, which is the dielectric constant. So according to the theory, if I have a cable and I send electromagnetic waves along the cable, then at the end of the cable, I could have some prongs that are coming out. Um, and as that electromagnetic wave goes down these ex exposed prongs, these metal, these metal uh, rods, then um, the electrical wave is influenced by the dielectric constant of the medium in which those rods are located. So you have a wave that goes down to the end and then it comes back and so you, know, you send out a signal you can measure the travel time and that travel time for the electromagnetic wave again is influenced by the dielectric constant um, at, those, at those exposed rods. If you put it in a vacuum it has a value of 1 and if you put it in water it has a value of 80. <clears throat> well it turns out that soil is pretty indistinguishable from a vacuum, so it has a very low number, <clears throat> while water has this very discrete value. And so we can put it into soil <clears throat> and see the, the range of this value um, and make a calibration against gravimetric water content. So just to illustrate, here is a TDR cable tester. This is kind of the old school way of looking at it, but it's a device that is sending out the wave signal um, then you have this prongs pushed into the soil, and in this case it's a three-rod probe, and it's the dielectric constant in the media, and it's for a cylinder around this. It's not right up against the rod, but it is sensing the dielectric constant of a larger media. Um, this shows just the theoretical relationship between volumetric water content on the x-axis and the bulk dielectric constant uh, in the y-axis. And so the relationship fits pretty nicely um, from zero to, you know, 30 or 40 percent water content. And remember, it's very unlikely that if you have a soil to exceed more than that. I mean, it, you know, you're not going to have soil with, uh, of course, 100 percent water because that would just be water. Uh, and with, when we look at soils in the Vado zone, we're most interested in this range from zero to 40 percent. And here's an example just to illustrate that. Um, here are two different soil depths from 0 to 90 and 90 to 120. Um, the, the solid black symbols are the surface layer and the open ones are the deeper layer. Notice again there is a lot of scatter but very discrete um, curves R squared of about 0.5. So um, you know there's, there's a lot of noise there you have to admit that. But if you look at the range here we typically see from 15% to about 35% moisture content. So the main benefit of a TDR is that, uh, of course, you've gotten rid of the, um, the radiomagnetic source. Um, you, you, you aren't measuring as a profile the way the neutron probe is. 
but you're not limited to just one sensor. You could put a whole string of neutron of um, of TDR. So in this case, you have to you have to like uh, you'd have to have a way of putting this into the soil. I've seen some where you know it's just like a long single device that can be pushed into the soil, or a, a core can be taken and then it can be pushed into the hole with with tight packing with many TDRs along the length. Or you could prong them in, um, you know, excavate and, and, and push the prongs into the soil horizontally or vertically. <clears throat> so you have to use multiple of these devices, but they're not particularly expensive for each individual sensor. And many companies make these available. So here's an example of the de a Decagon uh, capacitance sensor, this, this uh, EC5. So it's it's doing that, you know, he, here are the guides that are present in that case. Now remember, if we go back, we also had this other Decagon device, this MP1 sensor. I got a little hung up, but basically this is also measuring dielectric constant, or it's related to that. And so here it's being used to measure the matrix potential. In the other case, it's being used to measure water content, but um, there are similarities into that technology. It really shows the potential, and this has come up in for other technologies I've shown already, to measure, to use dielectric constant to measure the properties of the medium within which, um, you know, you can put a probe. Okay, a few other soil-related sensors for water, um, soil pore water samples. So what if you want to get a sample out of the soil in the unsaturated zone? Now you take the ceramic disk, disk, and instead of letting the soil suck water out of it, you invert that. You create a very strong vacuum in the cup, and that will overcome the soil's matrix potential, and water will flow from the soil into the cup. And once you've collected enough, then you can just draw that out. <clears throat> so here's an example. It looks very similar to a tensiometer, but now these cables are such that you can like use a syringe to create a vacuum, and then once you've created the vacuum, then um, it usually has different valves so that you can, um, you know, create a vacuum, then stop the vacuum, and then and then draw the water out. And this is just a photo to just illustrate a large-scale soil water sampling array. So a lot of times in in geomechanical engineering, uh, you need to be able to um, cope with the fact that water is draining all over the place like hill, you know hillside cuts or under the ground and so being able to sample that water um, is an important part of a lot of different construction functions and then the last technology here is called a drain gauge it's a device in which we're going to put this under the root zone in the soil and as water infiltrates down the water that goes into this stainless steel area then gets collected and uh, wicked down to a reservoir and then you can pump it out. So it's just a device that allows you to collect the water that you could leave permanently installed and you can put it in at a deeper level than you would might be putting in a tensiometer or, or a, a poor water sampler um, that isn't as, as susceptible to breakage as a ceramic cup. So to summarize, I've shown you a bunch of technologies to measure the matrix potential and the soil water content. The challenge with all this is that everything is interrelated, so it's hard to measure them independently. The gravimetric method is really the main independent method for measuring water content, and then everything needs to get calibrated or related to that depending on whether it's the neutron probe or the TDR or some other dielectric constant sensor. So, um, so those are the key technologies for characterizing the basic water attributes of uh, soil and water in the Vado zone.